We now have some time for discussion between Nick and Annette and Anastasia and Justin. And while we're bringing you all back on screen, I wonder if Nick and Annette, I can, I can just follow up on, on a couple of the things you just spoke about. And, and that is that it, this is a voluntary um, role that council's taking on with its partners. This is a strategy that sits alongside a, a, a precinct structure plan. So, so Nick or Annette, how, how did this come about? And Nick, how is it going to change the way Mitchell Shire Council operates? Or is it doing that already? Annette, did you want to take the history part of this? Yep. Okay, I'll, I'll start with the history part. Um, I mentioned it briefly. So this project really started as a resilient Melbourne project. So resilient yeah. Melbourne probably a lot of you are aware, um, was part of the 100 cities, resilient cities network, and really started some project within the city of Melbourne, but also broader metropolitan Melbourne. So that's how that project started. Um, and yeah, developed some ideas with project partners, but then at some point, resilient Melbourne actually kind of went back to focusing on the city of Melbourne. So that's why they stepped out of the project and kind of RMIT stepped in to okay. um, coordinate between the so project partners. So had Mitchell Shire Council been part of or a partner in that Resilient Melbourne project and, and knew about it and wanted to pursue it? Is that how it came about? Yeah, yeah we were. So we were partners uh, with the Resilient Melbourne project as part of a broader Beverage Northwest partnership that uh, we yeah. sat on and coordinated. And that partnership was really interested in understanding how we could look at this PSP differently. So this is Mitchell Shire's biggest currently uh, in planning PSP. Um, and we wanted to understand, well, how can we ensure that we learn the lessons of the past and have the best possible community? And I think that flows into the second part of your question around how does it mm. change or implement? And as Annette mentioned in her presentation, we are beginning the process of understanding how to implement a strategy like this. I think it's... Um, to answer the question, it's probably at a higher level about embedding the concept of resilience and particularly social resilience in new mm. and emerging communities across a range of different processes that council currently has. I don't think this is a plan that comes in by itself and fundamentally changes what councils do. I think it's about understanding how we do through a different methodology. Um, and key to that is really partnership. So whilst a lot of this does sit potentially with council, we need the support and ongoing partnership of all of the partners of the Beverage Northwest Resilience Plan and other partners to really realise uh, sort of the potential of this. Um, and I think that's where the, the challenge is, but also the exciting opportunity of this is, is what can we do with state government and federal government, and other developers, private enterprise, and a range of other partners to make resilience really a key part of new and emerging communities. Mm. Yeah, it's um, in a way, it's quite bizarre that it's 2023 and this is a first of its kind strategy, isn't it? But, but I suppose that's the world we live in. And um, I might jump to Anastasia and Justin and, and just get some more insights there again about how. Um, you know, a climate resilience focused PSP will impact council. And, and how did you sort of get that buy-in from elected officials as well, from your councillors? Who was the lead here? I, I, I can start, yep. yeah, and then hand over. Um, yeah, um, so it, the VPA, the, the, the state government are the leader of this process in this instance. Um, however, um, as the VPA are now implementing, are working through using their new uh, PSP to all guidelines, they work close with councils on and co-design a lot of the PSP uh, outcomes together. Um, so for us, uh, this is mostly a chance to um, step in and um, um, advocate for um, some of the our um, priorities for municipality, for example, delivery of street trees. This is our priority because we are historically on the lower side. Um, so how else it can help? Yes, as for particularly in Melton, we only have 50% of our PSPs delivered or prepared at this stage, and another half is still to be prepared, so it will have this direct impact on 
hopefully, on the future PSPs if this practice is adopted. And it's, yeah, also a good chance to, to, to test uh, the new concepts and do something differently. Uh, anything you would like to add? Oh, I was just going to make a comment about one of the fortunate things we've got here is we've got a good group of councillors who are willing to try something yeah. a little different and, uh, and to support officers to explore that. I think they've seen some of the developments that have occurred and they are sort of supportive to try the different, which is fan which makes it very good as an officer on a range of projects as well, which is great, um, which is good. Yeah. And I was going to say, I did see there was a, a question in there yeah, about thanks. the, the mature yeah. shade trees. Um, I'll be honest and say that we have, our residents have a love-hate relationship with street trees, um, probably <laughs> like every council. <laughs> um, so I think one of the, and that is one of the things that we are having a bit of a conversation with though, is that obviously trees take time to grow, but you know, you're looking at somewhere around about 10 to 15 years before you're getting something resembling the canopy cover to help shade those streets. So we are even having some conversations about the use of, um, I'll call it artificial shade or shade structures to help enable those outcomes as a short-term solution where appropriate, um, yeah. particularly car parks and those sorts of things. Bit street trees, streetscape's a bit trickier, um, yeah. but certainly in built, around built infrastructure, it's a little simple, a little easier. So we're having a bit of a think about how we can deliver that. Yeah. Yeah, good. And, and so thinking uh, along those lines, I suppose, of that early intervention or creative ways to do things. And I, I love that idea of a community hub in Beveridge Northwest being staffed by development officers, community development officers, as the houses are even being built. And, um, you know, that's a that's a interesting investment by a council um, and something that aligns with what we at NGAA advocate for all the time, which is, you know, get in there as things are being built and established and build that community or that infrastructure. But, so, you know, so this is the social infrastructure that we will be built. and. And so, Nick and Annette, how do you envision that working? And, um, you know, what sort of expectations do you have of the sorts of activities and work that will happen there? Yes, I think this is, this is, a, this is the key question, I suppose, when it comes to implementation <laughs> of plans like this. Um, at the moment, obviously, we're still very early in the implementation of this plan. So we're still trying to understand what that looks like on the ground. But... I think in terms of exactly what you said with the alignment with the advocacy that NGAA has done, and I know that probably every single council around the table yeah. here has done, it's that is early delivery and early activation is central. I think this plan um, helps to provide a really good evidence base for that. It shows the value uh, when you do achieve that early implementation and it connects I suppose it connects a lot of threads around that early implementation. It's not just saying that you've got this centre and that's activated. It's looking at, well, what's the whole network of resilience building in this community beyond this centre? Um, we talk about a hub being more than a building. It's the community around it. It's the way that building interacts in the community and the way it builds that community and supports that community through its development. I think this plan gives us the evidence base to have a better conversation around that and to be yeah. a little bit more nuanced in our approach. Yeah. Annette, do you have any um, further insights? I know that you've done some great work for, for NGAA and, and for other councils. So, you know, what are your, I suppose, hopes and expectations for this strategy? Yeah, good question. Thanks, Rowan. I think coming back to the early delivery, it's probably one of the things is just actually having it in there again. Mm -hmm. I mean, we all know that it's really important, but actually writing it down in the plan that the partners want to achieve it gives yeah. um, some space for ad advocacy so really trying look we have it in the plan we actually have to work together on that plan we would re really like to achieve it but also actually thinking together about some pos possible actions so my topic is always the early delivery of public transport so there might be some thoughts about well there are some developer buses out there would this be an option for beverage or what mm. would um a demand on demand bus like the flexi ride in Victoria be an option. So it's some of the opportunities are out there. And obviously, it's sometimes hard to implement them, especially as a council. But I think it's really, again, it's good to mention those options and to keep looking for options. And that's part of the plan as well. Keep researching, keep understanding what the impacts of the kind of deficit of infrastructure is to mm. actually have arguments for early delivery. Mm -hmm. One of the other things we advocate for and try and encourage across our membership is collaboration and, 
And given that, you know, Melton's to the west of Melbourne and, and Beveridge and Mitchell Shire Council are to the north, you're pretty close actually. So do you think, you know, not to put you all on the spot, but is there some sense that, you know, you've both learnt today how those PSPs could be influenced by the climate resilience and the social resilience? Is there any chance here of trying to incorporate a bit more of the learnings? Uh, yeah. Or is it, do you think just the VPA will, will go on and do their usual thing? No, I think that a platform like that is perfect to exchange um, our experiences and understanding of how things are planned and delivered and challenges of implementation. So yeah, it, it appears that we probably are. <laughs> Isn't it But no, we all follow closely um, how other PSPs are um, prepared. Um, uh, yeah, reading through the panel uh, reports and uh, getting those learnings. And yeah, we are trying to collaborate with um, yeah other councils um, on on particularly on on the PSP preparation process. So yeah, it's definitely uh, a good platform. Platforms like this, yeah, help us a lot actually to connect as well. And I wonder if that could even go across state borders because um, you know I know there's been fantastic work done in Western Sydney on heat island effect, and you know we heard last week about some really interesting initiatives in in the northern suburbs of Perth. So hopefully, you know these sorts of events. Um, plant these seeds of ideas but um, you know I'd, I'd probably look to, to just to think how long do you think it will be until we see some impact from from both of these from the the Melton East PSP and and the Beveridge Northwest Resilience Plan and and, and just a, a quick overview of how long it's taken to get this far I suppose um, start with Melton yeah uh, so the PSP is in the active stage of preparation at the moment, so maybe it's a good idea to follow up with us at the next, <laughs> uh, at the next uh, annual meeting um, uh, to, yeah, to see uh, how things are moving along. But in general, P all the PSPs are a long-term process because it, it requires a, a, a lot of background studies uh, prior to, um, yeah, prior to creating and uh, getting through all the uh, procedures to, to yeah. approve the plan. Um, yeah, normally it takes up to two, uh, two three years to prepare a PSP. So for, yeah, this one, we will see how things will unfold. But yeah, um, that's timelines are within with the VPA, but yeah, we are trying to support them as much as possible. Yeah, great. <laughs> and and think, Nick, yeah? yeah? Yeah, I think in terms of the resilience plan, um, Obviously, the, the plan is now a completed plan, um, and uh, we're happy to share through the NGAA uh, a web link uh, to the Mitchell Shires website, which has that plan available uh, on the website. But for us, it's more, and this goes across all of our work, it's about learning the lessons and implementing mm. where we can, where those lessons can help. And I think you're right, it's this doesn't end at Mitchell in Beveridge Northwest. This will go, as Annette mentioned, across all of our growth areas, but um, we would... Uh, we're always very keen to learn from others and share our learnings with others as well. So um, this is an ongoing process for Mitchell. I don't think I don't think we can ever say we've probably hit 100% resilience in a community. So it'll be <laughs> no. an ongoing process. <laughs> it will. Thank you. And you know, I think this has been a great um, follow-on conversation from our first um, discussion around um, housing affordability and delivery of of the 1.2 million homes and. Um, we have some very tight timeframes, but I think this process is a great example of the amount of time needed to do things well. And um, I commend uh, Melton and Mitchell Shire Council on the work that you're putting into this and really pushing the boundaries of, of what can be achieved. So thank you all very much for your contributions today. And uh, thanks for being part of this discussion as well.